I believe, having, having done this for you know quite a while now, you know, working with you and others, I think the first myth we have to bust is about bias itself. Bias can be good or bad, depending upon the context. And as we all know, it's never really changed. All leadership is situational. So there'll be some instances where bias is really helpful. There'll be other instances where it's not. And I think what you have to ensure is that you've got the, the system. Your system needs to be designed in an inclusive way, just like, a, just like a train nowadays is designed in an inclusive way. You need to make sure that your systems are designed in an inclusive way so that where bias might be present, it can be tackled and challenged. Hello and welcome to Voices with Talking Talent, the podcast that explores the real issues people face in the workplace. This is a space to have the open and brave conversations that inspire change and spark action. We're Talking Talent, and every week we'll be joined by a different guest. Stay tuned for discussions on the issues that business leaders are trying to overcome and what the future looks like for truly diverse and inclusive organizations. So hello, everybody. I'm Rebecca Hurston, and I'm hosting today's podcast episode. I'm also the head of women's leadership programs at Talking Talent, and I am totally delighted to be today with Dan Simpson from Siemens Energy. We go back quite a long way, um, having been working together over the years, and I'm just really excited to have you along to talk about our topic today, which is about beating bias myths. And for us at Talking Talent, when we saw that theme of the International Women's Day this year that many of you, probably most of you will be familiar with, um, which was Break the Bias, that hashtag that they were holding, we felt like, you know, this is a topic that deserves to continue to be talked about. We need to continue talking about this. It's not just something that's done as a one-off for International Women's Day. Um, So keeping the thread of that going, let's just jump in and get started. Uh, Dan, do you want to introduce yourself? Tell us what you do. Thank you, Bex. It's a great privilege to be talking to you again today. Uh, Always enjoy our conversations down the years. So hello, everyone. My name is Dan Simpson. I am the HR director in the UK and Ireland for Siemens Energy. Um, I also have another job is I directly support our chief inclusion and diversity officer, Maria Ferraro, with our inclusion and Uh, diversity strategy globally. Uh, I'm the secretary to our global IND council and I'm the lead of our governance and partnerships squad. So quite a CV there Dan and I know that Siemens Energy, I mean the Siemens itself being a really famous brand that I guess most of us have encountered, Siemens Energy being in fact a new company, relatively new company that has happened in its own right Um, and I know that it's uh, yeah a really growth time and an interesting period for you in that market yes it is Bex yeah and I, I joke with friends that you know I'm I'm um, part of a 170 year old startup um, energy is in many regards Siemens um, home turf and uh, it's actually my home turf so uh, a lot of my career in Siemens has been in the energy sector in the energy businesses I was the head of HR for our wind power business when we started it here in the UK I spent many happy years as part of the energy sector in all of its guises And we took the decision as a company, as indeed many companies like us are now doing, to separate ourselves because the conglomerate uh, bonus is now a conglomerate discount. And many conglomerates are struggling to actually tell their shareholders how they're making money and how they're adding value. So Mm -hmm. we took the decision to go into three parts. We have our healthcare business, which is now standalone. We have our Siemens business, which is where our digital factory and the mobility, the trains businesses are. And now we've got our energy business and we are the uh, major player in energy transition, which is very topical, but very complicated. Because as we always say to people, it is a transition. It's not a switch on and off. And we are going to have to live with fossil fuels for a while longer while we make the economic case for things like green hydrogen and actually turning renewables into a profitable, viable, long term operation, which is still a challenge. It's it's such a I mean, it's not my area, of course, of expertise, but it's such an interesting topical kind of thing that the world needs. So it must be a really interesting market to be in. I'm I'm interested as well, I suppose, the, the kind of industry, the kind of sector that you work in being more male dominated historically we're coming today to think about bias in its different forms and how that shows up and how people can 
belong in the workplace. And, and the other thing that it makes me think is you just talked about this 170 year old startup, I love that. Uh, but you know how we establish cultures, whether that's a new culture, an old workplace culture, but wherever we're coming from, you know how we how we keep growing, how we keep going forwards, um, and overcoming some of the, the those biases that that might be holding us back. Mm-hmm. What 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 the heck is bias? <laughs> I mean, what what are we actually talking about here, in your view? Well, do we need a technical definition, Bex, or will my definition? No, I want I want the Dan. <laughs> I want the Dan special. <laughs> well, I, I I've got an interesting relationship with bias because for me. When I first learned about bias, it was very negative in connotation. And indeed, many people do associate it with negativity. But actually, my, one of my early learnings about bias was that it can be positive as well as negative. And you know, a, a tendency or a prejudice towards something can be helpful. So, for example, uh, many people have a prejudice towards healthy eating, which, which isn't a bad thing because healthy eating will uh, mean less people needing long-term health care in the future, and that's better for us all. So you know, having a bias for whole foods over processed foods isn't necessarily a bad thing. And the question is, it depends where you got your programming from you know were you brought up in an environment where you were surrounded by lots of healthy cooking information about food positive food choices or were you surrounded in a an environment where you were given lots of negative connotations around food and food choices and 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 its outcome so bias is a it's a tendency it's a prejudice it's a it's an affiliation towards something or someone. Uh, and of course, organizationally, bias has been most often associated with a, with a negative connotation around the blind spot. Um, if I see you, Bex, as a, a, a female candidate in front of me at an interview panel, um, I might have a bias against you because I might be thinking to myself, oh, well, if I give Bex this job, Is she going to be in the office five days a week? Does she have caring responsibilities? And I'll be getting that from somewhere I don't know, but it's just there. It's asking, something's asking me those questions almost before I've I've got there. And that was, of course, one of the other learnings I had about bias was that bias is is natural and it's healthy in some regards because it's your brain sifting through the data. Now, our brain sifts through something like 11 million data points a day. If you weren't, having some shortcuts in there you probably go clinically insane so you need to have something which enables you to spot patterns and your brain loves being right so you know a brain pattern recognition that gets you to a to b quicker super that's absolutely great we do it every day when we're driving cars or we're going to work or we're going about our daily routines or we see a particular sign all of those things suddenly are, are biases that are programmed into you and your brain doesn't have to worry about them. It can focus mm. on the on, on the other topics. So yeah, that's that's where I am with bias. That's so interesting. I'm kind of I'm sitting here thinking about, you know, what's the relationship to then bias and habit? What you're saying there about the positive, the positive side of bias and what actually enables us to do. Yes. And how we can group, I guess, in the workplace, how we maybe use that to make shortcuts to make decisions and that there is a there's a, a positive take on that or about the habits that we fall into as well well if you if we had an inclusion bias within organizations that would yes. be positive yes. if if our whole bias was to yeah. root out micro inequities and instead have uh, micro affirmations that would be a good bias if our whole bias was towards it, it I, I recently was very fortunate to spend some time with one of the partners at McKinsey and she did one of the implicit association tests otherwise known as the IATs yeah so the and Harvard ones that the you Harvard ones if you google yeah. the Harvard IAT you can get those yes and, and now, now this lady is an extremely bright and capable um, neuro um, surgeon anyway and so you know she's one of the McKinsey types that's got three or four doctorates in in various disciplines so for her to suddenly discover that she had bias against women was was horrifying you know mm-hmm. where did that come from and I would like to come back a little bit to the science around some of this as well because i'm mm. i've over the years become slightly more healthily skeptical about it but what she always did then was she took a note with her she wrote herself a little note she took a, a little note to the meeting whenever that was a meeting to talk about a promotion or a development step and she would always say to herself why not a woman mm. just that little nudge was enough yeah. 
to stop. Oh, the so the kind of we're bringing nudges in to how we can shift out of bias. Yes, I believe so. I think people still wear quite a lot of them now. I think the Apple Watch has, has taken over the Fitbit for, um, phase. But I remember going to a conference once and hearing somebody describe unconscious bias training, for example, as a nudge. It's one of those things like the little wearable device that says how many steps have you done today or what's your calorie count today, et cetera. If you get that nudge, you might be more inclined to do something about it. And then I, like to your point about habit, once you start being nudged often enough, the habit then starts yes, to build. And then with the habit, you can form new neural pathways. Yes. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm coming back to the International Women's Day slogan, actually, break the bias. And I completely get why that was conceived. But almost you're, you're offering a different perspective on this to me, which is it's not just break any old bias. It feels like what you're saying is that there's some biases that, to your point about well, gosh, if we could have a bias towards inclusion, wouldn't that be a great place to get to? Yes. So it's kind of, in fact, I'm, I'm kind of smiling because I'm thinking almost we've got a bias against bias. Yes. <laughs> Poor bias. <laughs> Poor uh, bias, yeah. And I think that that's, that's the problem, Bex, because if you, if you look at what's happened as a result of unconscious bias training, a mm. multi-million euro pound dollar industry oh, yes. has emerged. Yes. around unconscious bias training and its promise is to recode you in essence mm. and here's a slightly different perspective on it most people are aware of their biases and they're proud of them and most people are aware of their thinking i'm not i'm not just giving you any really? old do you really thinking. think that like yeah. most people are actually aware of that i'm um noah really cool psychologist called Thomas Shamaro Pranucic. He wrote the book, Why Do So Many Incompetent Men Become Leaders and oh, What yes. to Do About It. Yes. Thomas is brilliant. You know, search him up on YouTube, Ted, he's got some brilliant talks out there. The, the psychology, the, you know, the, the clinical psychology and the correlation mm. between people's biases and knowing or unknowing them is very small. This, this notion that telling people about, about their biases, it helps them unpack them. There's no correlation between them at all. Most people are very good at hiding their biases. Mm. So most people wouldn't dream, I, I, I'm using averages here now, most people wouldn't dream of coming to work and telling you about their biases because they know that could be damaging. Because again, most people are very good at self-deception. Yes. And, that, and, and I think the science behind unconscious bias, it, for me, it's not clear because uh, unless you're prepared to act on the habit of the nudge in order to challenge yourself really for a lot of people what you do is you just tell them what they already know and if you come from a deep rooted place where that view has been formed over many many years in your childhood and, and beyond actually unconscious bias training can mm. cause your bias to become stronger oh it kind of gives more fuel to the fire in a way even indeed. if you might present indeed to the outside world that it was it was not so i think what you're linking is it's about well like so many things it's about it's not just about awareness awareness does precede action but there requires action yes so, and practice, so deliberate deliberate practice yeah yeah i mean i i once um sorry about no 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 go for it i've got loads of i know but i <laughs> got to hear Marshall talk in london um marshall goldsmith is, is one of the world's top executive coaches mm -hmm. and his book, um, everyone will know of his book because it's a phrase they will have heard, but might not have attributed to him. What got you here won't get you there. Yes. And what he, he shared this story with us when when he wrote that book, his expectation was it would be number one in the in the bestseller charts for non nonfiction. And when he called his publicist and asked what if he was number one, they said, "No, Marshall, you're not. You're a you're number two or three. He said, "Well, who was number one?" He said, "A, di a dieting book." And then he did a bit of research and he checked that in every year of American publishing history for recorded sales, there's been a dieting book in the American nonfiction top 10. You would therefore conclude, would you not, that America was the thinnest nation on earth? Well, <laughs> or that they were most in need of a diet book, perhaps. But right. yes. For me, it was a case of unless you act on what is what the information yes. is. And uh, Thomas says the same thing. You know, we all know that. In order to lose weight, you know, it says here you can't lose weight. In order to lose weight, you've got to 
eat a bit less, drink a bit less, exercise a bit, a bit, a little bit more. They're all quite hard things to do yeah. consistently. The easiest thing to do is to reach for the next glass of wine, the next sweet thing, and, and relax and put your feet up because you deserve it. And or to buy the diet book. Or to buy the diet book. And, you know, again, as humans, we are very good at self-deception. We're very good at self-deception. And I think that's where some of the, the, the bias training bumps up against the reality of what, what most people, what your average person coming into the office, you know, forget, there will be some that are highly emotionally intelligent, just like there'll be some people that run Ironman races. But for the majority who don't run Ironman races, this is hard work that requires you to bring your brain to work. Yeah. So we're talking about individuals, and I wonder kind of if we shift it to the organisational level, yes. where, where, are, where are organisations deceiving themselves when it comes to bias? You know, what, what do we think maybe that we've got handled, but we don't? When I, when I think about that question, mm. in it, my initial thoughts were centering around what I would consider to be the human resources life cycle. You know, I'm a HR professional, so I see a life cycle around onboarding and then people get promoted and they get developed and they get paid and eventually they exit. We all do, you know, in an organisation. I started to think, you know what, it happens everywhere, doesn't it? It happens in meetings, happens in conferences, it happens at the coffee bar, it happens in the corridor. There are biases everywhere. We've all got in-groups and out-groups, you know, like, like, like. Yeah. if that makes sense and the the thing for organizations is of course that if you get too much group think which is a bias in, in an organization because it, it's good it's good to be it's good to be along with other people again another i i like trevor phillips um i read the times and he always writes a very good column um in the times most weeks and i remember trevor phillips did a program about leicester and at the time leicester was considered to be the most diverse uh, city in britain and it was during the working day of nine till five. But actually, then when, at the end of the day, what you found was self-segregation was happening where, you know, the, the Indian and Pakistani community would go one direction. The white British community would go another direction. Humans self-segregate. We're tribal. And that happens in organisations. And organisations are great places to get tribal. You know, you can get tribal in your function. You can get tribal in HR. You can get tribal in supply chain. You can get tribal in your vertical if you're a big organization mm. like mine. You know, we are Siemens Energy, but are we? Or are we grid technologies? Are we gas services? Are we transformation of industry? Are we service? In fact, are we geography? Are we Lincoln? Are we Warwick? Yes. Are we yes. Newcastle? And, and so the bias, layers of identity here. Absolutely. And I think that, that identity piece is very strong because that, that's when you can really start to see where the bias is everywhere. It requires, again, it requires you to bring your brain to work. It requires you to, in every interaction that you have, you need to assume that there's bias present. And then I, for, for me, it's about just having a check to say, well, is it a positive or a negative bias? Because actually, I, I, like you said, poor or bias, I guess it, you know, it is what we make it, isn't it? It can be one or the other. So having a check with yourself, whether or not the bias is positive or negative, is like, like with the like with um, Julia at McKinsey, who says you know, she brings a note in to say, why not a woman? Yes. Or the person that can't stop selling and has actually end up selling the wrong stuff. You know, wouldn't it be great if their computer screen turned off after that next sale? So they had a moment to go, is that the is that the right thing for me to be but doing? Actually, and actually building on what you're just saying, and I'm sitting here thinking, we, we could actually wrongly assess that. So yeah, this is a positive bias. Because I want this kind of person on my team. Yes. Or this is the profile that I need to hire in next. This is the way we want to expand. This is how we want to develop our team culture. And, and so there's something to me about perspective and yes. you know seeking that from others. I mean, uh, next, we, we've got a gender target, you know. So um, if you look at many big companies now, they're judged by their record on sustainability, environmental, societal, or governance goals, and a lot yes. of funds will invest in a company based upon their ESG record. Yes. And so what do they do to show evidence of willing into the market? Most organisations have a gender target and gender targets have got a long history behind them. And, you know, some people see them as the devil incarnate. I, I, I take the view that they're a bit like democracy, but probably the worst form of government, except everything else that's been tried from time to time. So you need to focus minds. So a gender target, by definition, makes you biased towards female candidates. Because if, 
Yes. In a male only environment, which a lot of organizations, particularly like mine, are, you need to be biased for female candidates. Mm. And that, that, that could be a positive bias, therefore, because it forces people to think differently. So and a bias inversion. Yes, a bias inversion. Yes. And, and it's almost like it's a it's a it's unknitting the blind spot. It's saying, well, there will be many reasons why we as an organization don't have the same gender representation as society. By all definitions, I should have a 50-50 workforce within Siemens Energy and within the leadership ranks. I don't. Why? We could go off into another podcast altogether, couldn't we? But the point is that to fix it, I need more women in the organisation. So one, I've got to find them. Two, I've got to keep them. And three, I've got to keep the environment they're working in really, really inclusive and Mm. not so they're subject to everyday micro inequities, micro aggressions, which is what you tend to find happens. You know, it's the it's the crack, it's the banter or, you know, it's political correctness gone mad. And yes, the, you know, the banter. Yeah. I mean, that, they're all the things that then again, on a bias, that, that's where a negative bias then creeps back in. Because, you know, people, people say, well, you got to fit in. So, so to fit in, you have to start talking like the others. And. I mean, I've lost count of the number of gay men that I've met who have said they joined in the banter before coming out. They mm. joined in the banter on homophobic jokes because they, they didn't want to tell anyone that they were gay. Because of belonging, yes. And, and, and so because of the micro inequities that yes. were all around them, their bias became, right, I'll, I'll join in this, even though they were implicitly aware that it was the wrong thing to do. Mm-hmm. Power of the, the I suppose it's, this is this is culture. You know, what are we surrounded by, and what are we creating in our organisations? I mean, I wonder if you've got any bias war stories yourself, or that you've kind of encountered along the way. Also, how can we, how can we individually, and how can we, if we're bystanders on this, how can we support and 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 break down bias? In terms of bias war stories, I want to reframe one for you, because it would be very easy for me to sit here and say, well, I'm in HR. Which one of the executive team jobs are most suitable for putting a female candidate into in order to get your gender target numbers up? Yeah. HR would be right. Voting. Tactical voting. HR would be right up there, probably along with comms, maybe some of the finance roles as well. Three or four years ago, I didn't get a job that I went for and a candidate who was different to me got it and there were for a moment I convinced myself it was because their difference was the differentiator mm. and so my you know I'm, I'm talking to you about this now a few years older and a few years wiser what was really the differentiator was that they were just better qualified for the job than I was that's very honest of you to say <laughs> that well and of course Again, my, my own ability to self-deceive got in the way of a rational view about it. And then when I actually thought about you know, my career, I didn't go to an elite university and I've never been academically brilliant. I've always had to struggle and strive to, to get what to me always looked like quite mediocre grades. But what I didn't realise I had in abundance was quite high emotional intelligence and that's actually served me quite well in the paths that I've I've taken. So in my career in food retail and then coming here to Siemens, I've I have don't believe I've been the victim of bias other than in on a couple of occasions, because I'm not the type of person that will throw crockery across the room or scream and shout at people. The bias that I've suffered has been more along the lines of, well, he's too nice. Mm. Tough enough. Yeah. Can he make the big calls? Can he really go eyeball to eyeball? This kind of, you know, passive aggressive macho form of leadership. And this, the, the, you know, the leader, the leader is actually, you know, half, you know, half Arnold Schwarzenegger and Sylvester Stallone in the 1980s and then sort of half George Clooney in the 1990s. And you know, I, I by never... the way, I'm noticing you picked there just two, two men. <laughs> two men, yeah. Those examples. Yeah, and I, you know, I never conformed to that stereotype of the uh, macho leader. And what I've been really happy to see is that actually now we're talking much more about the compassionate, empathetic leader. I did a session last week with our leadership team about leadership essentials, and we were talking about 
leadership through the ages. And I asked them, you know, in the 1980s, who was the business leader that was most respected? And to my surprise, actually, not many people could remember it, it was Jack Welsh. You know, Jack Welsh was the man. And what was Jack Welsh's nickname on the stock market it was Neutron Jack. You know? And Jack Welsh was hard and tough. Mm, and he, mm. cold. he cold things, he made things efficient. But General Electric was the biggest company in the world. And still, I think, you know, his, his turnaround and that profitability and their net worth was still more in his tenure than it was in his, in his successors. So that version of leadership has given way now to, if you ask most people, you know, even if I ask my kids, who do you admire most? in the business world they'll say elon musk okay very different be on my list i have to say <laughs> yeah. but also thank on the other side you know lots of people are pointing towards jacinda ahern in new yes. zealand and yes. you know despite i think sorry so with the benefit of hindsight um everyone gets the right answer don't they i think most people will point to angela merkel being a real figure of stability even if she did make some policy errors didn't we all over mm. russia so I think there are there are examples now of different types of leadership that are forming. And the, again, the bias is moving away from this, you know, all action. And, and we get the anomaly pop up, you know, like Donald Trump. But again, I'm sure that in the, in the when you smooth it out over the course of history, these things will happen. Mm. So I, think, I love what you're saying here about actually part of breaking down bias, breaking down bias, breaking down the myths. Uh, that lead towards bias is having greater or well, greater diversity. There's that word again of yeah. models and of seeing that there's different tracks, different ways of doing it. What about the how? So in our organisations, how can we how can we create allyship? You know what what needs to happen in order to support people on the ground? Isn't it kind of I suppose there's an, there's two levels, aren't there? The organisational level, so. Those of the, those people listening, like yourself, who are in um, a role that actually makes decisions organisationally, and then all of us individually. I believe, having, having done this for you know quite a while now, you know, working with you and others, I think the first myth we have to bust is about bias itself. Bias can be good or bad depending upon the context, and as we all know, it's never really changed. All leadership is situational. Mm. So there'll be some instances where bias is really helpful. There'll be other instances where it's not. And I think what you have to ensure is that you've got the, the system. Your system needs to be designed in an inclusive way, just like, a, just like a train nowadays is designed in an inclusive way. You need to make sure that your systems are designed in an inclusive way so that where bias might be present, it can be tackled and challenged. A very simple way that you can do that is in the recruitment process, if your context allows this you can introduce blind cvs you can introduce you can take all data off except the competence of the of the role the downside to that of course is if you would need to be biased towards female candidates or candidates of a distant ethnic origin you may actually exclude them by accident so you have to always be using those checks and, and balances to do it i think the other myth we have to bust is that unconscious bias training is not a silver bullet unconscious bias training is like a gateway it's a gateway to learning and then what you've got to do with the learning that you've assimilated just which is to understand that you might be biased in certain situations is you've got to practice the habit of inclusion mm. every day in your in your daily work and that's about the micro inequities and replace them with micro affirmations and of course i, I do appreciate we're in a bit of a a fluid world at the moment aren't we where to say the least yeah <laughs> people describe yeah. culture wars going on and there are some people that say that you know the end of western civilizations is what this looks like when we're arguing over what's a woman i mean i can't believe we're in a situation where people in power are frightened to describe a woman as a woman because you've obviously got very vocal minorities now who are very very angry about their treatment but even then, I'm starting, to, I'm starting to get to see some more hopeful signs that some balance is coming back into the conversation. Because, you know, if you take like the, the, you know, the trans issue, for example, very controversial. Lots of people have got different views on it. I listened to Ricky Gervais's special on Netflix the other, the other night, and you know, he attacked everybody. He attacked Christians. He attacked Jews. He attacked Muslims. He attacked straight white men. He, extract, he, he attacked gay people. He, he attacked all kinds of uh, groups. The only group that called for the show to be cancelled were the trans community. 
Mm. And this is where we've got these, you know, they, now they have clearly got a bias that they need to address. And, you know, and you can see some sports bodies now are starting to address that, that issue. And it's controversial, but you can see if you apply those lessons to organisations, you've got to start addressing some of them with courage and understanding where if you if you are imbalanced in your workforce, whether that be ethnically imbalanced or gender imbalanced, you've got to take some decisions in the system that yes. unknit some of the wiring. Yeah. So if you've got the privileged group making all the decisions about hiring, you've got to bring some of the underprivileged, underrepresented groups in. You've got to do what people like you do really well, mm -hmm. which is that if you've got underrepresented groups and you want to make them more representative, you've got to give them special training, mm -hmm. special yeah. help. Like, for example, the women's leadership programs that you've run so well down the years. Lots of men say, well, that's not inclusive, is mm -hmm. it? And you say, well, hang on a minute, guys. You've got an 80% advantage in this organization just because of your gender. Yeah. So what's not inclusive about trying to, and this is for me, Bex, when we go back to, I've, one of other things I've learned quite recently is equity. So I, I wasn't quite sure about equity at first because I, I, was, I was trying to work out, well, what does it really mean in the context yeah. of IND? And I don't, I don't know why. I just, perhaps I'm, so I'm not academically brilliant. So it takes me a little bit longer to work these things out. But I suddenly just hit onto the notion that equity is about, delivering the promise you know, equal opportunity and equality is is, is an aspir is something that you try and do but then when you've achieved it you've got equity because then it doesn't matter you really come as you are and your your access to all those yes things yes yes it's kind of the, the, the point we get to yeah and you mentioned and thank you for your kind words about the sorts of programs the women's leadership programs that we certainly run at talking talent with wonderful clients like yourselves I mean, is that is, is that the is that the solution? Doing and what what how do women's leadership programs programs for underrepresented talent more broadly are they a part of the solution here? Are they going to have their day in a few years' time? Like where where do you see us going with this? Well, you see, I, I don't believe so. I, I tell you for why. I, I was around and remember the terrible murder of Stephen Lawrence and the um, accusation that the Metropolitan Police in Britain were institutionally racist. Mm. And Presidia Dick, who's left the Metropolitan Police now under a cloud of institutional racism, sexism, misogyny, corruption. And if you look at the groups of people that make up the Metropolitan Police, I don't think you could tell any of them that they didn't need a Black Police Officers Association anymore, or that they didn't need to do some more work on how to be more inclusive with the communities that they're encountering and dealing. It's a bit like, you know, every, day, every article I read about the death of HR, we, we seem to be in more demand than ever at the moment for the, for the kind of work that we're doing. And so I believe some of these things are hardy perennials. They're like mentoring or sponsorship. I think you will always need to work with people who through their, again, if you go back to where, where does bias come from? It comes from the programming we all receive from a very young age, from the influences, the inputs, the choices we make about food, the choices we make about diet, the choices we make about what kind of places we want to live, the people we want to get married to, the communities that we're allowed to engage with or we're not engaged with. I mean, how can it be that in 2022, black players still turn up at football matches and get racially abused? Yeah. You, you think that would, but it's not. It's not out of the system. It's still very much there. And again, it goes back to my point. Again, I think that some people are very biased and they know it and they hide it mm. and so one of the you know I think one of the mistakes we say to people or my, my belief is that you know come to work and be yourself I'm not sure we want that for everyone oh really think, say more about that what, well, what I, I think that I think that the persona that you demonstrate at work is the version of you that you want other people to see that's in congruence with the organizational values that you choose to work for mm. so for example at Siemens Energy one of our values is to be open and inclusive. So I come to work and I'm open and inclusive. Mm. I'm biased against Tottenham Hotspur Football Club because I'm an Arsenal supporter, you know, but I wouldn't say rude things or sing songs about Tottenham Hotspur Football Club at work. But I might assume the message is that, oh, you know, come to work and be myself. So I'll sing football songs about the yes, things that, okay. that we don't like. Do, do you see what I mean? It's a, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm reminded of... Um... Oh, it was Rob Goffey and Gareth Jones, the prof uh, um, professors at London Business School, and they uh, they had a Harvard Business Review article a few years back, and it was all about this, be yourself. Well, it's not just that. It's be yourself. 
more like your your best self with skill yes so there's kind of consciously what what are we bringing who are we bringing i mean goodness i'll have to invite you back and we'll have another conversation about authenticity but i think thing. i think it's so important i think it really is because i think people can mistake the the view that you you need to just you know come as you are unvarnished no 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 yes. you, you need to come you need to come as you obviously but you need to come with a filter and, and work at it. I mean, I think this is really something I'm, I'm kind of concluding right. the conversation yeah. is you have to bring your brain to work. You've said that a few times yeah. because I, I love that phrase as well. Like, likes, like. So we need to have our own antenna up for ourselves individually, but also for our teams, perhaps for an organizational lens, depending on our role. Kind of have that awareness so that we can put things in place to, to overcome it. Again, that, that big piece that I'm taking from what you're saying is we've got to we've got to consciously work at this to overcome it and it's i, I love your phrase it's a hardy perennial so like it or not you know we all want to bust the bias break the bias break it down send it away forever and I, I don't think we will i have um believe that bias and prejudice to a degree is inherent in the human condition we're, we're tribal creatures and Thank if it wasn't the colour of our skin, it would be the clothing that we're wearing or the town or city that we're, we're born in. You know, we're tribal creatures and prejudice is inbuilt. Town. And of course, what Together, we're very good at is adapting. And we're very good at adapting to situations where we can learn to get along. You can the world at the moment is a less tolerant place than it was, I believe, three or four That's years ago. You know, democracy is generally in decline like around the world today, at the moment. You know, sure the health of democracy is, is at a Thank lower you. point in history than it's ever been. And some of the values that, that you and I might say we hold are not held by the majority of people in the world at the moment. So our need to understand each other is, is even higher than it's ever been. But you, you can't go in there with this assumption that you know best and you know right you've, you've got to really go in there with that old classic of you know seek first to understand then be understood yeah well listen dan simpson this feels like a great note to end it on seek first to understand then to be understood i don't think we've managed to crack it all today i didn't expect us to it's a pretty complex topic but thank you so much for all your insights um i hope everybody's enjoyed listening thank you again to dan simpson for thank you energy it's been a pleasure thanks so much bex thanks everyone you're very welcome. Bye.